Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you, as always, to bring you another author interview. This week, I spoke with author Lisa Braver-Moss about her new novel called Shrug. Let me give you the description of that book. It's Berkeley in the 1960s, and all Martha Goldenthal wants is to do well at Berkeley High and plan for college. But... Her home life is a cauldron of kooky ideas, impossible demands, and explosive physical violence. Her father, Jules, is an iconoclast who hates academia and can't control his fists. Her mother, Willa, has made a career of victimhood and expects Martha and her siblings, Hildy and Drew, to fend for themselves. Meanwhile, Jules' classic record store, located directly across the street from the UC Berkeley campus, is ground zero for riots and tear gas. Martha uh, perseveres with the help of her best friend, who offers laughter, advice about boys, and hospitality. But when Willa and Jules divorce, and Jules loses his store and livelihood, Willa goes entirely off the rails. A heartless boarding school placement, eviction from the family home, and an unlikely custody case wind up putting Martha and Drew in Jules' care. Can Martha stand up to her father and do the one thing she knows she must? Go to college. With its running soundtrack of classical recordings and rock music and its vivid scenes of Berkeley at its most turbulent, Shrug is the absorbing, harrowing, and ultimately uplifting story of one young woman's journey toward independence. So Shrug is a coming-of-age novel. It is set, as it said in the description, against the backdrop of Berkeley in the 60s. And Martha is kind of a part of that and part... She just wants to she just wants to live her life. She just wants to manage to make it through high school and go to college and deal with everything that you have to deal with high school in high school and you know, bullies and self esteem and everything. But that's compounded by not only that what's going on in society and in the world, but in her own home and her family life. And it's this really compelling story of journeying with Martha through this whole process and seeing her struggle and grow and try to figure out just what is her place in this world and what is her place in relationship to her parents and her siblings. How does she fit in? Should she fit in? All of those great coming of age questions. And I really enjoyed walking that journey with Martha because she is a compelling character. There were, you know, some things that reminded me of myself in junior and junior high and high school, but you know, not a lot. There was enough for me to see myself in that character and think, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to go back to that on that time in my own life. No, thank you to adolescence. Um, there's humor, there's times that will, you know, there's, there's times that just make you go, oh, wow, you you know, there's history, all kinds of wonderful aspects of this book. So let's go ahead now and turn to that interview with Lisa Braver Moss. Oops, once again, why do I always do that? I do have a, I do have copies to give away. So stay tuned to the end of the podcast to know, to learn more about how you can enter to win a copy of Shrug by Lisa Braver Moss. And now to that interview. This call is being recorded. Lisa, hi, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I am very happy to have you here, and we are going to be talking about your new novel, which is called Shrug. Uh, Before we get to that, though, I would love for my listeners just to get to know you a little bit. If you could share something about yourself, that would be great. Oh, all right. Well, I, um, I... This is my second novel. Shrug is my second novel. Um, I've written one other, and I've written nonfiction books and many, many personal essays. Um, Really enjoy all of it. Um, I didn't start writing until I was really in my 30s, and it wasn't a... um, 
it wasn't something I grew up thinking, oh, I want to do this. Um, it was just more in my 30s, I suddenly wanted to, there were things I wanted to say, and I kind of trained myself to write in a way that could be published, and and that's that's how I got started. Okay. Um, so if you could give us then a, a bit of an overview of the story in Shrug, that Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. This is a coming of age story that takes place in Berkeley during the 1960s. And uh, our main character, Martha Goldenthal, is living with uh, domestic violence and real emotional brutality um, at home while she's trying to um, make the best of her situation in, in by uh, trying to achieve in school. Um, and she, we follow her um, through school and through high school, um, and the uh, the challenges that she has um, achieving and really fighting the family culture of chaos and and sort of anti academic attitudes. Um, so she's got a she's got a uh, she's got her plate full <laughs> just yeah, to kind of does. cope with yeah yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in a time, especially in Berkeley, when there are a lot of protests going on, a lot of different kinds of rebellion, she is just really trying to, you know, keep her grades up and and be kind of, quote unquote, what she might think of as, as normal, um, which is almost her way of yes. rebelling. That's exactly right. That's exactly that is her radicalness um, with because within her family system, she she is rebelling. She's rebelling against all the chaos and unpredictability and uh, and and difficulties at home. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the the uh, the uh, Berkeley setting, which I meant to also, um, because there was a tremendous amount of of social change going on at that time: protests, riots, um, sit-ins, um, and this is something that the main character really, you know, she sees it's going on around her, but she doesn't really have the bandwidth emotionally to, to fight any moral battle other than what she's fighting at home, just to kind of keep her head above water. Mm -hmm. um, so she, she sees this happening with this tremendous, tremendous vitality in Berkeley at that time. And, and um, lots of, lots of protests, as I was saying, and she, she sees it going on, but she can't quite identify with it as a young person because she's dealing with something else. Right, right. And her parents definitely, you know, they come to the family with their own issues. Her father is verbally and physically abusive, and we get a little bit of explanation on his time in the in the army and maybe some, some underlying mental health issues. Her mom also was a little harder for me to grasp. I mean, her mom just, oh my gosh, I wanted to throttle out. Well, both, I didn't like either of them, but her, her mom, talk a little bit about Martha's relationship with her mom because it's complex. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really um, important question. Um, this is a mother who is, is often very collapsed. And when she's not collapsed, because she is a battered wife um, and she does, she does have, you know, she is dealing with, with violence against her as well as the children, uh, she doesn't really pay that much attention to the the children's suffering. It 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 seems to this mother that it's uh, secondary to her own suffering, and she's just very self absorbed and um, really, as it turns out in the book, not very capable of love. But because Martha is the middle child, and as she describes it early on. Uh, um, I only liked my mother because no one else in the family did. So I just mm -hmm. kind of forced myself to like her. Um, and, and, and this is, she, she sees it as her, as her job as, as rescuer in this situation to prop up the mother and to, to, uh, to be the one that the shoulder that the mother, um, it, I think Martha doesn't see her own suffering as being primary. I, I think she sees the mother suffering as, as, as the mother does, which is this is more important than anything else in the world. Um, and because Martha invests so much in that relationship in Shrug, in the relationship with her mother, um, she's completely unprepared for the fact that the mother doesn't 
doesn't feel that way back, doesn't really reciprocate. Um, and so she's completely caught off guard when the mother abandons her and the rest of the family. Um, and, and I liked the, it is a complex relationship. She, she wants to please her mother. She wants to please her father also, but she, she recognizes that she kind of can't please him and she can't tame him. Um, but yeah, she, she's got this very, um, we would say today, codependent relationship with the mother. And that kind of defines her sense of herself and her obligations to the family. She feels very obligated to, to um, comfort her mother. Um, so that's, that's where, that, that's where she, as, as you said, but this, this mother really doesn't, isn't capable of love in the way that most mothers are capable of love, it turns out. Okay. Um, and before I ask my next question, I've got a little bit of strange feedback going on. Um, oh, oh. I think I can edit around it. There was just a little bit. Of, um, yeah, there it is. Did you move something or? I just moved this folder away. Um, okay. Should I, is that okay. better? Um, yeah. Is... Now you're just you're sounding a little more like you're in a tunnel. So uh, I don't oh, know dear. if you moved further away from the microphone or. Well, I just kind of turned my head. Um, I can hold really still. Does this work? Yeah, yeah, that does. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry to make you hold really still, but <laughs> that's I the least understand. of my problems. <laughs> I <It's> know. My... <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for that. And now we will. Um, uh, we just talked about the relationship, so let's backtrack a little bit. What was your inspiration for the story as a whole? Well, I, um, I had a childhood that was pretty nightmarish. And um, so I, I drew from my own life to write this story. Um, that was my inspiration. And, um, and also to, to, as I went along the writing, in the writing process, um, it occurred to me, oh, some other people that grew up with domestic violence will, will also see themselves in this. And it's sort of, it was, it was secondary to my own, um, to my own, that was secondary to my own desire to, to really tell this story um, the way I felt it needed to be told. Mm -hmm. So does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And um, talk a little bit more. We've talked about Martha some, but, uh, what about her character do you think might resonate with readers? Well, I think she's just, she's dealing with the, this untenable situation with a battering father and a, and a very, um, difficult and at times cruel mother. Um, and she doesn't, as I was saying, um, she doesn't see the mother as, as, uh, being cruel to her, she sort of doesn't recognize, but the reader does along the way. The reader recognizes that the mother is is really uh, not really shouldn't have been a mother, um, and and the girl that Martha does not really recognize that. Um, she she, as I was saying, she thinks it's her duty to prop the mother up, um, but uh, yeah. That and now I I've I've forgotten now what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> just about Martha and what, what about her might resonate with readers? What, what, you know, what yes. you like about her being the author? Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned this because um, she, yes, she, I, I, I came to really love Martha and that was a very important thing because um, in, in writing her character um, I had, I had many choices to make along the way and, making her a sympathetic and lovable character did not come as easily to me as, as, as one might think. Um, and this is where my own childhood experience was kind of bleeding through the, the writing process where um, I, at first, my first drafts, um, it, it didn't, she didn't really come across as, as sympathetic the way she does now. And I think, you know, you're, you see this girl just wanting to, uh, wanting to do well in school and, and having all these obstacles in her way to, to doing what she wants to do. And I think it's, I think the reader does identify now um, with, with Martha um, and, and see her as lovable. And that was a, that was a very 
healing process in a way for me personally to to make this character lovable was kind of profound for me um Mm -hmm. to really make her that way on the page um forced me to for for instance um for instance the character might the character might um sort of rattle off a litany of her woes and a litany of her own character defects let's say she might be very self-critical she is very self-critical but that's different from the reader taking that away and not liking the character those are two different things so it's 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 a delicate it's a delicate matter um how to make a character complex but also one that can be identified with readily mhm yeah and a big part of Martha's life and Martha's character in this book is her shrug that's the name of the book um can you talk a little bit about the shrug? Yes. Um, this is something that, that just kind of came to me. It's not something I've personally experienced, although apparently about a quarter of school age children will have a transient tick of some kind at some point along the way. So this is a pretty common thing. Um, in the case of Martha in Shrug, the shrug doesn't go away. Um, But it kind of came to me as a good way of showing that this kid has a real, that she's got real problems and she's not getting up with the real problems that she has. And these, these real problems don't have easy solutions. It's not clear whether this, this shrug is, um, we think that it's psychological. uh, We think that it's caused by a psychological um, experience, experience, but, um, but we're not sure. And yeah, it 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 was a powerful um realization that that could that I don't know how to it just kind of, these things kind of come to you when you're writing and mm-hmm. um if if you're lucky <laughs> jackpot, you know, if you're having a jackpot kind of day. Um Right. And I like I liked it because I you know, this this character is so serious and she's so focused and and sincere and earnest that it's sort of, she's anything but shrugging. Right. But Mm -hmm. on the other hand, yeah. But on the other hand, there is a way in which she, she is shrugging in order to, she is shrugging off her family problems in order to achieve what she wants to achieve in life. And so I, I just, I liked it and it kind of just fit Martha. Jumping in here so we can take a quick break uh, when we come back. More about Shrug with Lisa Braver Moss. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Lisa was talking about Martha's character and her shrug and how that influenced the story, how it influenced the writing. And so let's go ahead and get back to that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I can see how that might have really helped helped bring her story along in terms of her as a character and in terms of how she navigates this very difficult life that she's going through because not only does do her does she have difficulties at home but she she has trouble in school but she doesn't admit it she hides it really well yes um, yes and, and go ahead no and this is this is where i think um, people may may be able to identify with Martha in Shrug is that she she is dealing with uh, such overwhelming um, kind of constraints and and issues at home. Um, she really is having trouble concentrating, 
and she somehow manages to kind of imposter her way through <laughs> through through being a good student but she does think of herself as an imposter or or as you know as somebody that that is somehow getting by and she has no idea how she's getting by. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, I think that the kind of situation she's in, it's, it's difficult for any kid in that situation to really um, be able to learn and concentrate. It's not an easy thing um, when you're that preoccupied. And as I was saying about bandwidth for the social protest that was going on in Berkeley at that time, um, bandwidth is an issue for her her developing brain also she's she's just so preoccupied with the family situation that it's it's hard for her to grasp and then hold on to um certain kinds of information that that are important right right and you know she's it's not like she's not dealing with enough she's got her family situation she is bullied at school because of the shrug uh, you know she's she's got a lot on her plate plus when we start when the book starts out she is a teenager she's 14 like the worst most awkward time yes can possibly right. go through <laughs> right right um now another part of the story that um a big part of the story is music martha plays violin she is in choir and uh she does realize that she doesn't shrug when she's playing music but there's also her father owns a record store there's just there's a ton of music in this book can you talk about that yes yes i i uh, i'm glad you brought that up um yes there's i'm i'm i think of the all the music in the book as kind of a uh, a running soundtrack to the book and um, uh, there, there's there's some contrast between the classical recordings that her father is so um, so enamored of, and there's there's contrast between that and all of the new music coming out, the rock music, um, and certain jazz uh, jazz music also. Um, and then there's the contra- there's the fact that she really. Uh, listens to what her father says about certain classical recordings and listens to his assessment of, of them and really um, agrees with him a lot and, and has a similar experience of certain recordings uh, to the experience that her father has. And this, this makes her feel, I think in a way connected to him, although she she really has a role in the family of being critical of him and, and calling him on his bad behavior. Um, so it's this, it's this kind of push me, pull you where he's got, he's got the world of classical music deeply, deeply within him. And he wants to spread the word about, about his, he, he wants to hold forth in his store and kind of um, hold forth about these recordings. And She's interested in all of that, but it doesn't translate into a close relationship. It's there are ships that pass in the night. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a sad element to it. But yeah, um, it, it just became clear to me that this was uh, that that music was needed to be in the weft and the weave of this story. Yeah, and actually, before I even started reading the book, I'd um, I'd flipped to the back and uh, saw. No, I didn't read the end first, but I fl- <laughs> I flipped to the back, <laughs> and um, I have this I have this strange. I have to know how many pages are in a book before I start reading it. So I, I see. flipped to the back, and and I, I saw this that that you listed all of the music in there, and there's just like Beatles songs, Beatles songs, Beatles songs, and I was like, Yep, I'm gonna like this book. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I, I love the Beatles, although Martha's a little critical of the Beatles, but that's okay. Right. Right. That's part of that's that's part of her personality, certainly. Yeah. And yeah. and part of her identification with her father, I think. Um, yeah. And how her father ever sells any albums is amazing to me because he's so <laughs> critical. <laughs> he's always yeah, le- le- lecturing customers on, you know, their horrible taste in music. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's he's right. yes, he's there as the arbiter of good taste in music. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty hilarious, if I do say so myself. <laughs> oh, I agree. Um, do you what, what kind of um, what kinds of research did you do for the book? Well, um, there were certain things. Although this is, um, I, I had my own childhood to draw on. There were certain things I had forgotten. Uh, for instance, certain language, certain expressions that we used at that time. I had to 
sort of ask my age peers and say, oh, did we say this or was that more like elementary school or what, you know? Um, so I had to I had to research that. Then there was the tear gas um, incident, which um, which I had to research because I didn't really experience it myself. Um, and so I didn't really know what it would be like to, to be on the inside of that experience. So I had to do research on that. And that was very helpful. Um, it was actually helpful to have YouTube too, for just for actually mm -hmm. seeing some of it, some of this stuff um, and photographs and so on. Um, and what else? Um, oh yeah. Events on campus. You know, when did, when did this people's park demonstration take place in relation to the timeline of the book? And when did, this anti-war demonstration take place and all of this had to be factored in. Mm -hmm. And are you musically inclined? Was that something that came naturally to you in terms of the, not only the music, but the music theory and um, Martha has perfect pitch, et cetera? Yes. Um, I am not as gifted as Martha. I, I certainly have musical talent, but I'm not, uh, I don't have perfect pitch. I mean, I used to kind of have a little bit of it. Uh, it it's a strange thing, but it's not a binary. Um, it's not, you either have perfect pitch or you don't, but you can have some version of it. And I did have some version of it, but it's gone away as I've gotten older. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now I used to be able to tell, you know, oh, it's F major and it sounds like Beethoven. It must be Beethoven's eighth because Beethoven's eighth is in F major. You know, things like that I was capable of that I that I no longer am capable of, but I have the conviction, but not the accuracy. So it's it's pretty awful. I can't, I can't, I can't tell it because I'll think something's in a certain key and I'll be completely wrong. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really terrible. But, um, and my, my son who, who does have perfect, perfect, perfect pitch, um, makes fun of me, but, um, th that's okay. I don't mind. Um, so, <laughs> tell him so, you taught him how to use a spoon and to hush. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I tell him he gave me a hernia when I was pregnant too. Oh, there you go. Was, yeah. That was not very nice. <laughs> so, no, that was very rude. Yes. Yes. So, um, so yeah, I made her, um, exceptionally musical and I thought this is, this is a good, um, outlet for, for Martha. Um, this is, this is going to be one thing where even though she can't get her father's um, approval or, or acknowledgement for being musical, um, she, she can still have a life from this. She it's, it's going to be a difficult life, but she can have something out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, talk about the, the historical setting of the book. So it's Berkeley in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, yes. Was that, because of your personal experience or was there a, another reason you set the book in this particular time? Well, it was, it was partly my own experience, but I thought um, this is perfect because the chaos going on at Berkeley can kind of um, juxt be juxtaposed with the chaos going on at home and in Martha's psyche, um, the, the turmoil. Um, it really was a time of, of, of great change. And as I said, vitality, certainly, um, but it was a, it was a chaotic time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of created a, a the perfect background for Martha. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. You said this is your second book. Uh, do you want to talk just briefly about the first one? The, well, this is my second novel. It's my fourth or fifth book, actually. But oh, okay. um, it's my second novel. My second other novel, novel, yeah, my my other novel is. Um, is called The Measure of His Grief. And uh, that came out in 2010. Um, that's a book about a Jewish doctor in Berkeley, also set in Berkeley, who takes on, even though he's Jewish, he takes on the circumcision controversy. And he decides circumcision is wrong and he's going to fight it. And it's a, it's a story of how he what he loses in terms of professional standing and even personal um, personal standing um, mm. from going on that kind of going on that campaign. And it's about Jewish identity and um, and and so on also. But I took an interest in that topic because I've written a lot about that topic, and I thought, oh, what if what if there were a story about this, and what would it look like, and so that was that was a great 
deal of fun to do that book. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there'd be yeah. a ton of a ton of interesting conflicts in terms of the science versus the um, spiritual and theological aspects. Uh, yeah, oh yes, it's yeah. it's very it's got a lot of layers to it, and it's it's a fascinating topic. I, I mean, people make fun of it and they make jokes, but it's it's actually about human sexuality and um, and it it is quite an interesting topic, um, especially if you want to write about it in a way that's not inflammatory, <laughs> um, right? Right. Because it's it's a it's a big challenge. But um, so that was my other novel, and then I've written a couple of other books. Um, one of which, actually, speaking of the measure of his grief, um, one of which is a book of ceremonies for Jewish families that decide not to circumcise, um, mm. and that book. That book came out in 2015. That's called Celebrating Brit Shalom. And um, that that was one of my books I co-authored, actually. And uh, and I had, my first book was back in, in 2000, and that was uh, called Celebrating Family. And that was a book of uh, about interviews that I did with people about their families of origin. Um, and that was great fun to write. That was my first book. Um, yeah. Oh, fun. So, Yeah. Sorry to jump in here once again, but let's go ahead and take our second and final break of the podcast. And when we come back, the conclusion to this interview. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. author Lisa Braver Moss about her new novel, Shrug. And are you working on anything now? Well, I'm, I'm promoting my book. I'm promoting mm-hmm. Shrug. Yep. And yep. Um, that's, it's kind of all Shrug all the time. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm tinkering, I'm tinkering with other ideas right now of what, what's going to be next for me. I think I need to wait for the well to fill up a little bit, a uh, little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm sort of ruminating right now about what I might want to do next. Okay. Fun. And so you said you didn't start writing until you were in your thirties. Um, how did that process then kind of get jump started for you? Yeah, I, um, I was a technical writer out of college. I majored in English and then I got a job as a technical writer in the computer industry, which in those days was kind of fledgling. And um, I was I would write user manuals explaining how to use certain equipment or certain software, and uh, some of them were for engineers and so on. And so it was very technical. And I actually got uh, some good training out of that. That was that was uh, it, it seemed very boring at the time, but <laughs> but <laughs> I learned a lot. I learned a lot about mm-hmm. computers, and um, and it was good. As I said, it was good training. Um, when I was in my 30s, I and my boys were Jewish, and my boys had both been circumcised. I began to to want to write about it, and that was why I said, "Oh, it's that I I had something to say." I wanted to. I, I wondered, you know, what if I wrote about this, and um, and could I get an article published? You know, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And that led to a lot of research on the topic, and. Um, and actually years of years of work on that topic. Um, so that's how I got started. I, I got started with a, a very, very difficult topic. 
But yeah, for yeah. some reason, <laughs> that really grabbed me because it was challenging, but it was also um, it was also something I I felt there, I had a lot of questions about. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. What has been the reaction in the Jewish community? Well, um, I, I'm very proud of the fact that largely I get respect um, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, there have been occasions where it's it's not the case, but um, but most of what I've written is is so uh, kind of straightforward and and reasonable that um, and and written with such reverence for Judaism, really. Um, even though I'm against circumcision, um, it, it's it's been surprising and and very pleasing to me that for the most part, you know, I, I've gotten published in in major Jewish um, uh, magazines and and news, and that doesn't you know that doesn't usually happen with this topic. It's it's you know it's a uh, it's a pretty people's defenses are pretty high around this topic. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, am, am I included in the mainstream? Not quite, not quite, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but that's okay. They can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, and I, I just love that you're working within your tradition and, you know, you wrote the other book about alternative ceremonies that you can have instead of a breast, yeah. but, you know, those sorts yeah. of things. So I, I think that's really great. Thank um, you, Sarah. Yeah. Out of your own journey, then, would you have advice for aspiring authors? I do. I think, um, you know, when I first started working as a technical writer, um, it, it was I was um, I was pleased to see that you could you could um, move things around. You could move paragraphs around. And that, that mm. um, this was something that I had no exposure to because no one did before that. It was a matter of, of typing or if you didn't type. You could get through college by handwriting very neatly um, your essays, uh, every other line, um, you know, skip skip every other line, and mm -hmm. you could hand them in that way. And so I just barely knew how to type when I started as a technical writer. But um, because we can really move things around as, as writers, I would say to, to aspiring writers, start where it's easy. Just absolutely start where it's easy. Don't start at the beginning if the beginning seems hard to you. Start where it's easy and build from there. And then you'll be able to add things before and things after, and you'll be able to move things around. And um, it's infinitely, the, the medium now, word processing, is, is infinitely forgiving. I mean, you can always, you can always go back and change things um, until mm -hmm. something's published, of course. And it's a very... Um, this is something Jane Austen didn't have and Dostoevsky didn't have. I was just have, thinking that. You know? Can you imagine writing War and yeah. Peace by oh hand? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that was, Tol that was Tolstoy, but um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, right. But... I mean, but Crime and Punishment, right. I mean, it's it's incredible. And, you know, sometimes I even imagine, well, what would Dostoevsky have have done in Crime and Punishment if he, if he had had word processing? He probably would have added this element of the book really earlier on and I mean, seriously, you can you can sometimes read things and 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 think, oh, it, it, this could have been moved and it would have made more sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Not that I'm criticizing yeah. Dostoevsky or anything. But <laughs> right, but I'm just you know, saying it, it would have been a different I, writing process. That's right, and it, it this this business of being able to manipulate text however you like is it, it just never gets old. I'm always so thrilled about that um, the yeah. cut and paste function. <laughs> it's really it's it's kind of strange to be talking about a word processing function in, in terms of aspiring writers. But I think, you know, I think starting where, starting where it's easy, like for me, dialogue is easy. Dialogue just comes easily to me. I have an ear for it and, and setting scene. Um, creating plot is a lot harder for me. And maybe that's true of a lot of people, but, um, but yeah, just if dialogue is easy, start with dialogue and, and see where it goes. Um, so that, I mean, that's just, that's a, that's not a broad suggestion, but it is a suggestion for how to begin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not a solution for how to, how to really create, go through the whole creative process, but it's a, it certainly is a strategy for how to begin. Just remember that, you know, start where it's easy. Anyway, that's my advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> are you reading anything fun this summer? Well, I just, I just read two really heavy books, um, which, okay. which was fun, which was fun for me because I enjoyed them so much. And one was educated by Tara Westover, which, which is just fantastic. It's just an amazing book. Um, and it, it has, my book shrug has been, um, I'm extremely flattered that my book has been compared to, to, um, educated, um, because it's, it's a masterfully written book and, um, and a very, very powerful story about a, uh, anyway, I don't, I don't need to go into it, but, and then I read, um, I read Eve Ensler's book called The Apology, which is kind of a genre bending uh, book that's also just masterful. Um, an imagined apology from Eve Ensler's father who severely abused her. I mean, every, in every which way. And what would an apology from him look like? What would it, and she writes from his point of view as if he were apologizing to her in a genuine way. And mm. it is really, it really packs a punch. It's, it's, it's a wonderful book. And uh, so now I'm, now I'm on to other things, but those were two wonderful, wonderful books um, that I read earlier this summer. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, where can people find you? Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Um, share all that lovely information with us. Yes, I do have a website, and it's lisabravermoss.com. It's all lowercase, lisabravermoss.com. And there's information about Shrug, uh, my new novel, on that website. Um, you can get it on Amazon, get the book on Amazon. And um, I'm not sure if this is what you meant by by share a little of this information, but, mm -hmm. um, I always like to put in a plug for the independent, uh, your independent local independent bookstore, um, which you can get shrug, um, through indie bound, I N D I E B O U N D. Um, it's a website. I think it's indiebound.com, And, um, that's a website through which you can order the book shrug, um, at your local independent bookstore. And so that okay. gives them the business. Um, so that's another thing. And then I have Facebook, uh, Lisa Braver Moss author, and, uh, that's my Facebook page professionally. And I just, I'm getting my feet wet in Twitter. I don't, uh, I don't really tweet yet, but I'm, 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 getting up my nerve. I have, <laughs> I, I, have a few, <laughs> I have a few followers. It just seems a little daunting, but, um, but I'll get the hang of it. I'm sure. Um, and I have, I have a few followers already. So I'll, <laughs> um, and that's uh, at Lisa Braver Moss. Um, and I think shrug has a hashtag hashtag shrug. Um, it's okay. got its own hashtag. Yeah. Yeah. So, nice. and I'd love, well, I'd love I to hear from people. I have I have all the confidence that you will you will master Twitter. <laughs> you can do it. Well, thank you, thank <laughs> you. I mean, I guess compared to documenting printed circuit boards for engineers, it, it shouldn't be that hard for me. But <laughs> well, every everything's different. Though. Yeah, everything's different. There's no international standards. It's every every piece of software is different. And as I said, the bandwidth issue. <laughs> yes. So yes. I'm I'm waiting for the, uh, not to mix metaphors, but I'm waiting for the well to fill up a little bit more as I, as I was saying before. Um, and you know, maybe one of these mornings I'll get up and I'll say, this is the Twitter morning. So, yes. so. Yeah. well, good luck with that. Yeah. And is, there, is there anything that we haven't covered in this interview that you would like for people to know about, um, shrug or any of your other books or writing anything we haven't covered? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots to talk about. I I think you know one of the things that I've been uh, ruminating on because I I want to discuss this in one of my book talks that's coming up this coming week. Um, uh, you know, at bookstores, uh, book, uh, but one bookstore and one library. Um, is just you know why choose fiction instead of a memoir? Um, that's that's kind of mm -hmm. that's a question that's that's been asked, and and that I think. For me, um, I think I would have gotten with memoir. I think I would have uh, would have gotten a little. I, it, I would have been susceptible to getting derailed by um, obsession with what actually happened and trying to assess what actually happened and trying to find the right people to tell me what really happened. And um, 
it just it just sounded nightmarish to get bogged down in that level of um, uh, level of fact. Where with fiction, I really found that I could um, I could use fact as I as I remembered it, but I could also just be free to make stuff up, and I I did make plenty of stuff up, mm -hmm. um, and and then also getting kind of getting into that teenage voice um, was was also. Uh, kind of helped me decide once I, once that kind of kicked in, um, I became, I became more convinced, oh yes, this is fiction. Um, because this, this book was a lot of drafts. It, it, um, because of its highly emotional content, um, I think to the reader as well as to me personally, it, it was, um, it was a difficult, it was a difficult write. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, in fact, I think the only reason I didn't get more triggered than I got in writing this book um, is that I really I was so driven for for precision in the writing. Whether I mean whether it was the truth um, or actual fact, um, or, or the emotion versus the emotional truth, um, I really it it was it was a matter of um, I just, I've kind of lost my train of thought here. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear, okay. what am I? That's okay. It it now, was yeah, it yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just saying that um that it make it makes a lot of sense what you're saying because it does read a lot like a memoir, but I can understand how it would be a little easier as the author to navigate it if, you know, you weren't if you weren't also trying to work through some of the things that you experienced in your own life. You could you could fictionalize right. some things. You could make things turn out the way maybe you'd hoped they would have. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, that's, that's right. And, and there was something very gratifying about that and just letting, letting the story kind of uh, get its own oxygen and, and go, you know, take off on its own. Um, so that was, that was something, you know, this fiction versus memoir thing. And then the, the, the triggering content um, I, I would say, you know, as I said, it's, there were a few times when I was writing and it, it was, it was really painful and, and, you know, and I had to get up and, and leave and do something else. But overall, I would say I just so much wanted to get it emotionally right that mm -hmm. I didn't, I, it, that was, that was the overriding concern. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel like parts of it were cathartic as well as triggering? Yes, yes, I did feel that parts of it were cathartic, and you know, I can only hope that it's more than catharsis because no one out there cares about my own personal catharsis. I think <laughs> people just people want a good read. You know, they want to right. keep turning the pages and they want to be interested in the characters, and that's you know that's the concern. So um, I, I very much kept that in mind, um, as we all have to as as novelists for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much um, for taking the time to speak to me about the novel. I really, really appreciate it, and I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Ditto. Ditto. I enjoyed speaking with you, too, and I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about Shrug and, and my own writing. Um, so thank you. And once again, thank you so much to Lisa for taking the time to talk to me about this coming-of-age novel. I really enjoyed getting to know Martha as a character and uh, experiencing her her struggle and her journey and her coming of age story. So if you are interested in um, winning a copy of Shrug by Lisa, then all you have to do is go to one of our social media pages, GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and comment on the post with this episode. It's episode 175, interview with Lisa Braver Moss, and just leave a comment and you'll be automatically entered to win a copy of Shrug. So once again, that is GSMC Book Review, um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and you can win a copy of this really wonderful coming of age story thank you so much for joining me uh, thank you again to Lisa for joining me I hope that you will join me again next week I am about to uh, hop on an airplane and travel for a while but I will still be back with more more interviews and more episodes um, going to visit the in-laws so it should be fun and hopefully it won't be too humid because I grew up on Mon in Montana, and I'm a wimp when it comes to humidity. So wish me luck, and I will talk to you um, next time. In the meantime, I hope you and I have time to get lost in a good book. 
Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed.